Income tax 2022-2023 depreciation. Election to exclude property from makers, use of standard mileage rate and basis. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from publication 946, How to Depreciate Property Tax Year 2022. You can find it on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line one income. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement. Although just an outline of scaffolding, other forms and schedules flowing into it. One of those being the Schedule C. In essence, an income statement in and of itself with business income minus business expenses. The net business income flowing into line one here, income of our income tax formula. First page of the form 1040, we're focused on line number eight, noting the schedule C would flow into the schedule one, which would flow into line eight of page one of form 1040. The schedule C, profit or loss from business, has an income and expense section. We're focused here on the expense side of things, thinking about depreciation, which is an accrual concept that we have to deal with even if we're a cash-based taxpayer because the tax code forces us to do so. Noting that means that we put something on the books as generally an asset and allocate the cost of that asset over the useful life in doing so, one of the standard methods we could use is the maker's method, which is usually going to be a form of double declining balance with like a half year type of convention. It's like an accelerated uh, straight line type of method. And then we would have to determine what the life is, which is often dictated by the code as well. So given that, now we're thinking about the election to exclude property from makers. So you might say, I've got property, I'm putting it on the books. It might be machinery or something like that, equipment, furniture, you're putting it on the books. Usually you would be using the maker's depreciation, which usually is a type of accelerated depreciation, a double declining balance type of system. If you're familiar with the depreciation methods, in other words, it's similar to a straight line, but we're taking more of the depreciation up front in the early years with it. Now you might say, I don't wanna do that. You might say, I still want a straight line depreciation or something like that. Now, normally, if you can get an accelerated depreciation, that's what you would want. You wouldn't want the straight line from a tax standpoint because our goal usually is to depreciate more early because then we get the benefit uh, faster. That's the general rule, but there might be exceptions to that rule. For example, if we think that uh, depreciating more in the current year would be less beneficial because we have less income in the current year and we expect our income to be going up in future years, resulting in higher tax brackets in future years, we might have a situation where we would like to depreciate at least evenly or possibly more in the, in the tail end because that's where we would have higher tax rates possibly. All right, given that. So if you can properly depreciate any property under a method not based on a term of years, such as the unit of production method, you can elect to exclude that property from makers. So unit of production method is another kind of depreciation format, a way to calculate the depreciation that's tied to your production. So if you have a piece of machinery and you're making things with a piece of machinery, you can tie the depreciation not to years but rather to the things being produced. For example, a printer, try to tie out the depreciation, not to how old the printer is, but how many pieces of paper it has printed, for example. So you make the election by reporting your depreciation for the property on line 15 in part two of form 4562 and attaching a statement as described in the instructions for form 4562. 
So that's more of an unusual type of situation, but could come up in certain, in certain circumstances. So you must make this election by a return due date, including extensions for the tax year you place your property in service. However, if you timely filed your return for the year without making the election, you can still make the election by filing an amended return within six months of the due date of the return, excluding an extensions. So you would think you would need, in essence, mostly to pick the depreciation that's going to stick in the first year or close to it, possibly with that amended return, you know, within six months, because after that point in time, you, you would need consistency, you would think, in depreciation method uh, going forward. So attach the election to the amended return and write, uh, quote, filed pursuant to section 301.9100-2, end quote, on the election statement. File the amended return at the same address you filed the original return. Use of standard mileage rate. So this might be another reason why we might deviate from the depreciation method of, say, a maker's depreciation method because we have an automobile where we might have a choice or option between taking the mileage method or taking the actual, which would include depreciation as well as fuel and so on and so forth. The mileage method is typically thought to be an easier method, oftentimes, especially for sole proprietors, small businesses, because uh, then, then you don't have to track all the individual items as easily. And even when you do track the individual items, such as gas and whatnot, it can be difficult to allocate how much is gonna be business related versus non-business related. And sometimes to determine the amount that is business versus non-business, you still need to track the miles to use a percentage, a ratio kind of system to figure that out. So the easier method of course would be then to try to figure out the miles driven and just used then the base rate that they give you to calculate uh, your your expense, in which case you're not really doing the depreciation thing on the car, but using an alternative method, which includes both the cost of depreciation, or is designed to, as well as other costs related to the car, like the gas and the, and the maintenance. So if you use the standard mileage rate to figure your tax deduction for your business automobile, uh, you are treated as having made an election to exclude the automobile from makers. So you can see publication 463 for a discussion of the standard mileage rate. If you want to dive into that in more detail, we touched on it a little bit in some prior section of course. So what is the basis of your depreciable property? To figure your depreciation deduction, you must determine the basis, in essence, like the cost, kind of similar to the cost of your property. To determine the basis, you need to know the cost or other basis of your property. So cost as basis. The basis of property you buy uh, is its costs plus amounts you paid for items such as sales tax, it's the exception below, freight charges, and installation. So let's say you bought a big freezer or something like that for your ice cream shop. Then the cost of the freezer is clearly going to be a cost that will be included, you know, something that you would de be depreciating but also the shipping of the freezer to get it to the place you need it in the store to store the ice cream is also something that would be included in the amount that's gonna be depreciated uh, as well as the installation to get the freezer in place so it's ready to rock and or roll, right? So in other words, you might think that I should be able to take the freight charges and the installation fees and just record them as expenses and only record the cost of the refrigerator for the depreciable item. But generally, to get the refrigerator or freezer ready to roll, you had to not only buy it, you also had to ship it and you had to install it before it was ready to be in service. So all of those things would be part of the basis, which is why you might think of it as a little bit different than cost, but quite similar to cost. Also, you would think of that thing being put on the books generally at the point in time it was it was kind of like put into into service okay so the cost includes the amount you pay in cash debt obligations other property or services so clearly if you paid cash for these items purchasing the fridge paying the freight and so on that would be uh, included in the cost debt obligations so so you might take on debt uh, in order to pay it. So if you financed the freezer, you didn't pay cash for it, 
That's the same situation we talked about in prior presentation where it's similar to your home, where people make the mistake that because I have a loan on it, I don't own the home, for example. You do own the home. The phrase saying that the bank owns my home it was started out to be a joke. That's a joke. The bank doesn't own your home even though you owe the bank 80% on the loan of the home. Because again, the bank can't come in and tell you what to do with the home. They can't tell you to landscape the home. They can't tell you to paint your home. They're not sitting at the kitchen table telling you what color the, the living room should be, right? They can't do those types of things. So so the, the loan then is, a, is like a separate a separate thing. So if you if you finance the same kind of idea here, if you finance the equipment, you still own the equipment, you're going to put it on the books at the cost of including the amount that you financed. And then you're going to have to deal with the financing, which of course means that you're going to pay back the loan in the future and the interest on the financing, which is the rent in essence on the purchasing power that you used to buy the, the freezer in this case so that you can make revenue selling ice cream. Uh, the rent on that, the interest may also be deductible as well as a, as a business expense, right? So other property. So obviously if you, if you traded in an old freezer for the new freezer or something like that, then that that's kind of part of what you paid for it. There, there could, you might think of that if you traded anything, if you gave them a car for the freezer or something like that, you're still paying them and you'd have to then figure out how much it costs, given the fact that you kind of bartered in a situation or services. If you gave them free ice cream for life or whatever, you'd have to value the value that or something. So exception, you can elect to deduct state and local general sales tax instead of state and local income taxes as an itemized deduction on Schedule A Form 1040. If you make that choice, you cannot include those sales tax as part of your cost basis. Now this gets a little bit messy because uh, remember for just normal taxes for schedule A, you might be able to deduct sales tax. Now the, sale, the, the, the sales tax would only be deductible if you had greater, uh, if you had greater itemized deductions than the standard deductions. And usually if you're in a state that has income tax like California or New York, you're more likely to then take the income tax as opposed to the sales tax. But if you live in a state that has sales tax as their primary revenue generation source, then, then you might be able to deduct the sales tax. Now, when you make a big purchase of something like a freezer, then that could substantially increase the sales tax. So then the question, should I be able to get the sales tax like on a schedule A or would, it, would I be able to take it on the schedule C? Now, there's a kind of a question of which one would be most beneficial if you have to depreciate the freezer Good idea, girls. Freezer over a long period of time and you had to include the, the sales tax on the schedule C, if you had to depreciate the sales tax, then you might not get a benefit until the useful life of the freezers is taken up over five years. If for some, if somehow, some way, you could separate the sales tax from the cost of the freezer and deduct it, get the tax benefit in the current year, then in some cases that might be beneficial. It's more of an unusual situation. Assumed debt. I mean, so in general, you would think normally though, the sales tax would be part of the cost of the freezer that you'd have to include in the cost and depreciate over the life. Okay, so assumed debt. If you buy property and assume or buy subject to an existing mortgage or other debt on the property, your basis includes the amount you pay for the property plus the amount of the assumed debt. Example, you make $20,000 down payment on property and assume the seller's mortgage of $120,000. So your total cost is $140,000, the cash you paid plus the mortgage you assumed. So settlement costs, the cost of real property also includes certain fees and charges you pay in addition to the purchase price. These are generally shown on your settlement statement and include the following. So oftentimes when you buy like real estate, for example, if you're buying a business building or something like that, then you've got all the costs related to the purchasing process, which you would think would also need to be included in the cost of the building that you purchased or the property that you purchased, which you might then have to, to kind of deviate or allocate uh, between land and building. So you got legal and recording fees, you got abstract fees, service charges, owner's title insurance, amounts the seller owes that you agree to pay, such as 
uh, back taxes or interest, recording, uh, recording or mortgage fees, charges for improvements or repairs and sales and commissions. So for fees and charges you cannot include in the basis of property, see Real Property and Publication 551, Real Pro Property Real Estate obviously is a is a more complex situation oftentimes due to the dollar amount and the complexity with the purchasing of real estate so other bases other bases usually refers to bases that is determined by the way you receive the property so for example your basis is other than cost if you acquired the property in exchange for other property as payment for services you performed as a gift or as an inheritance so if you acquired property in, in this or some other way, see publication 551 to determine your basis. So notice that the basis, if it was an arm's length transaction, if you went out and bought a forklift or something like that, it's a pretty straightforward uh, type of situation to determine the basis. But what if you what if you had a, had a basis, like you bought something from like, like a, a related person or something like that? then the transaction might not be an arm's length transaction. And what if you were gifted the property from a parent or something like that, then you might be using it in the business and whatnot, but what is gonna be the basis at that point in time? What if you inherited the property? So once again, you didn't buy the property, so you don't really have the price that you need for the basis. So, so you're gonna have to think about, well, what's gonna be the basis gonna be? So like if it was gifted to you, for example, you might assume then that the basis might be kind of related to the basis of the person who gave you the gift or something like that could be the case. If you want to dive into that and do more research publication 551. If you inherited the property, then you have a kind of a weird situation because uh, like if the property was part of the estate of the person that died, then it could be subject if they're wealthy enough to an estate tax, the death tax, meaning they already pay taxes on it, not as an income tax, but as an estate tax or death tax. And therefore, when you get it, you would think you would get a step up in basis, which is usually a good thing, right? We would like to, like if someone gave, gave us property or we inherited property, I would like that, like they gave me, let's say they gave me a, a business building. I would like the business building to, to, if I had a choice between the business building having a $100,000 basis or a $30,000 basis, the $100,000 basis would be better. And I didn't have to pay for it. I just got it for free, but I, I would still like to, <laughs> to have the basis that I can then allocate and depreciate over time. Or at least if I sold it in some future point, the gain would be less or the loss would be greater if I had a higher basis. So the higher basis is usually good. So if, there was a, if it was an inheritance, do you get a step up in basis at the point in time that the death happened? If it's a gift, do you have to take on the basis of, of the prior person, which might be lower than the current fair market value? Those questions kind of come up. So property charge from personal use. If you held property for personal use and later use it for your business or income producing activity, your depreciation basis is the lesser of the following. So now you had something, let's say you had, you know, a home or something or whatever, something that you're using for personal use, and then you converted it to business property. Well, you're left in the same problem here. I don't know what the cost is anymore because when I bought it, it cost something different than the current fair market value when I transformed it from personal to business property. So one, the fair market value of the property. So it's the lesser of one, the fair market value of the property on the date of the change in use, meaning when you converted it to business or two, uh, your original cost or other basis adjustments uh, as follows. A, increase by the cost of any permanent improvement or additions and other costs that must be added. B, decrease by any deductions you, you uh, claimed for casualty and theft losses and other items that reduced your basis. So in other words, you're, you're transforming something that was personal into business property. It's, a, it's a, something you're gonna depreciate you would think it would make sense from a tax standpoint. They would want you to put it on the lesser of the fair market value, meaning the cost at this point in time, which usually you would expect to be lower than what you paid for it because most things go down in value, except real estate, which could go up in value. That's why it's the lesser of the fair market value or your original cost or other bases adjusted by A and B below. Okay, so example, several years ago, 
Nia paid $160,000 to have a home built on a lot that cost $25,000. Before ch uh, changing the property to rental use last year, Nia paid $20,000 for permanent improvements to the home and claimed a $2,000 casualty loss deduction for damage to the house. So land is not depreciable, so Nia includes only the cost of the house when figuring the basis for depreciation purposes. So the adjusted basis in the house when Nia cha changed its use was 178,000, which is the 160,000 plus that's the what she paid for it 160 plus the 20,000. So 20,000 for for the improvements minus the 2,000 casualty loss uh, that she had. So on the same date the property the property had a fair market value of 180,000. So 180,000 is greater than the 178,000 we're taking the lesser of in this case. So of which, but then 15,000 was for land and 165 was for the house. So now we have to break it out between the land and the house. So the basis, the basis for depreciation on the house is the fair market value because now we took the 180,000 is for both the building and the land and 15,000 uh, was for the land. So now that reduces down to the 165,000. So now the lesser of the two, the 165,000 or the 178,000 is of course the 165,000. And that's the one that be used. So because it is less than Nia's adjusted basis. Okay, property acquired in a non-taxable transaction. Generally, if you receive property in a non-taxable exchange, the basis of the property you receive is the same as the adjusted basis of the property you gave up. Special rules applies to determining the basis and figuring the maker's depreciation deduction and special depreciation allowance for property acquired in like-kind exchange or involuntary conversion. So those are two kind of special situations that you can dive into in a lot more detail, like kind exchange type of situation or involuntary conversion. For example, the government coming in and saying, we need this property for a particular freeway or something <laughs> and telling you, telling you that is what it is. So see like kind exchange and involuntary conversions under how much can you deduct in chapter three and figure in the deduction for property acquired in non-taxable exchange. So you can take a look at the publications uh, here on chapter three and chapter four, if you want to dive into that in more detail, find that on the IRS website. So there are also special rules for determining the basis of maker's property involved in a like kind exchange or involuntary conversion when the property is contained in a, a general asset account. So you can see uh, how to use general asset accounts in chapter four of the publication if you want to dive into that in more detail. Adjusted basis. To find your property's basis for depreciation, you may have to make certain adjustments, increases or decreases, to the basis of the property for events occurring between the time you acquired the property and the time you placed it in service. These events could include the following. Installing uh, utility lines, so paying legal fees for perfecting the title, so uh, settling zoning issues. You can see most of these, of course, are on real estate type of type of property, and the question is, are these types of things that need to be included in you know the basis or not as you get the property set up and ready for business use receiving rebates uh, incurring a casualty or theft loss for a discussion of adjustments to the basis of your property you could see adjusted basis in publication 551 if you depreciate your property under makers you may also have to reduce your basis by certain deductions and credits with respect to the property. For more information, see what is the basis for depreciation chapter four of the publication. Basis adjustments for depreciation allowed or allowable. You must reduce the basis of property by the depreciation allow or allowable, whichever is greater. So notice when we're depreciating the asset, depreciation is good, we want that. We want to be able to take the depreciation because that's an expense. Unforeseeable expenses. Uh, and as we take the depreciation, we decrease the adjusted basis, which is like the adjusted cost. We want the adjusted cost to be as high as we can, right? So we're re but we're reducing the asset in essence, the basis, the, the property that we have, and we're expensing the cost. So, so again, we like the expense, but it also reduces the asset, right? So depreciation allowed is depreciation you actually deduct from which you've received a tax benefit. 
depreciation allowable is depreciation you are entitled to deduct. So you want to make sure to not give up your capacity to deduct the depreciation. So if you do not claim depreciation, you are entitled to deduct. You must still reduce the basis of the property by the full amount of depreciation allowable. That would be not good because that would mean you could have depreciated it. You didn't get the benefit of depreciation and you had to reduce the basis, the adjusted cost, which means you don't get the depreciation in the future. And when you sell it, you can have more of a gain or less of a loss at the point of sale. So if you deduct more depreciation than you should, you must reduce your basis by any amount deducted from which you received a tax benefit, the depreciation allowed. So how do you de uh, treat repairs and improvements? If you improve depreciable property, you must treat the improvement as a separate depreciable property. So now you didn't just repair it because if you've repaired it, you would bring it back to its normal state. Like if you just repaired the roof, but if you put on a full new roof, you improved it, you've extended the useful life, then you might have to depreciate that. Should you just increase the cost of the building or the adjusted basis of the building? No, you put it on the books generally as another asset that has another you know, useful life uh, for an improvement. So improvement means an addition to or partial replacement of property that is betterment to the property, restores the property or adopts it to a new or different use. And note, we do use the term, they have the, the term restore the property here. So you can get into messy situations in terms of, is this something that's a repair or is this something an improvement as a general rule you would like to be able to record something as a repair easily repaired because then you would get the depreciation in the year of the repair as opposed to having to record it as an improvement which means you have to depreciate it over a long period of time and if you're talking about real estate that could be quite a long period of time so it's a quite significant difference and worth looking into when you're doing a substantial improvement to see whether or or repair to see whether it can be qualified as a repair or improvement. So see section 1.263A-3 of the regulations for more information. You generally deduct the cost of repairing business property in the same way uh, as any other business expense. However, if the cost is for a betterment to the property, to restore the property or to adopt the property to a new or different use, you must treat it as an improvement and depreciate it. So example, you repair a small section of section on one corner of the roof of a rental house. You deduct the cost of the repair as rental expense. So now you're not repairing the whole roof. If this is a common example, right? The roof is always an issue. <laughs> so you're just trying to plug up the hole and, and bring it back to restore it. That's just a repair, not an improvement. However, if you completely replace the roof, the new roof is an improvement because it it is a restoration of the building. So in other words, you've kind of extended the useful life of the building beyond what it was before is one way you might think of it. And therefore it could be an improvement. That's much worse because you don't get to deduct the whole cost of the roof in the first year, but you might have to depreciate it over a long period of time because it's real estate. So you depreciate the cost of the roof now. So do you have to file form 4562? Use form 4562 to figure your depreciation for depreciation and amortization. Attach form 4562 to your tax return for the current tax year if you are claiming any of the following items. So you got section 179 deduction, which we'll talk about in future presentations. For the current year or a section 179 carryover from a prior year, see chapter two for information on section 179. Depreciation for property placed in service during the current year. Depreciation on any vehicle or other listed property, regardless of when it was placed in service. See chapter five for more information on listed property. We might talk about that more in the future. A, a deduction for any vehicle, uh, if the deduction is reported, on a form other than Schedule C, that's the normal small business schedule, that's the form Schedule C form 1040, amortization of cost if the current year is the first year of the amortization period, depreciation or amortization on any asset 
on a corporate income tax return other than Form 1120S, U.S. income tax return for an S corporation, regardless of when it was placed in service.